uh, what your right hands possess. And of course, this is a big bone to pick among Western academics. You know, how come Islam allowed for women slaves and all of this stuff. The first response that you need to understand is that, you know, if you just change the terminology just a tad bit, just a little bit, I'll take five more minutes and I'm done, inshallah. If you change terminology just a little bit, historically speaking, when were women taken as captives in situations of war? I'm not talking about the Islamic civilization alone. Historically speaking, any civilization, when are women taken as prisoner, either, either under prostitution or under war, right? They're taken as captives, POWs. Now, either of those scenarios, how pleasant are they for women? Those two situations in which women are under another's rule, another's you know, uh, authority. Both of those situations are horrendous, even today. If women are captured in a village by a military, you know what happens. In our times, by the most civilized army, right? By the most humanistic army. The army that takes two years of ethical training, and then goes and takes over a village, what happens to those women too, right? Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, and it, you know, our deen isn't in idealism, our deen is in practical realities. The practical reality is this situation will occur. There will be women that you know, will be in that situation. So what do you do with them? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put them under the authority of the believers. And the other interesting thing in this, is that you know, POWs, you can do whatever you want, unthinkable things with them and nobody can question you. But this is not the case with malakat aymanukum. What your right hands possess, they have rights. Their children have a shared inheritance. Practically they enjoy everything a wife enjoys. The only difference is the term nikah. And why not the term nikah? It's a very simple thing. You know the nikah is a transfer of responsibility. That's, it's a contract which transfers responsibility from who to who. It transfers responsibility from the previous wali to the new wali. The previous wali was who? The father, if there's a brother or a grandfather, somebody, the man of the house, right? And now who's the new wali? The husband. It's a transfer of responsibility. In situations where the woman was already inside your house. I mean, before Islam, even the Sahaba owned some women. They're already there. If you do nikah, nikah technically means transfer of responsibility. So who are they transferring responsibility from? Themselves? It doesn't make sense. So what do you have to have? The responsibility itself. The transfer is not so important as the responsibilities themselves. So what does Quran and Sunnah do? It reveals the responsibilities. In those situations, in case there's a transfer, nikah. In case there's no transfer, the responsibilities apply. You follow? So this is the second thing. So it's semantics. And if you just look at this one word, responsibility, and you say, you know what, you have a problem with the word concubines? Let's talk about the word responsibility. Let's talk about Western society, where every two and a half to three minutes a rape is taking place, and teenage girls in public schools are getting pregnant, and they don't know who did it. And this hideous society is, is coming to life, and nobody's taking the one word, <laughs> nobody's taking responsibility. Nobody's taking responsibility. They don't even know where to go. And there's this chaotic situation in the society. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He reveals something that takes care of the chaotic situation in society. And the final comment about this, probably the most important one. Between ayahs number 32 and 33 of Surah An-Nur, which is the next surah. This is Al-Mu'minun, the next surah is Surah An-Nur. 32 and 33, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is homework for you, read tafsir of 32 and 33 of Surah An-Nur. In those ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened the door for women that were owned at the time, that they can work their way to getting married to somebody and earn their freedom. And once that happened, the only women that were left in the possession of right hands of the Muslims were either women that were, you know, um, in some way uh, handicapped, that couldn't get married for whatever sickness or something else, or they were too young to get married. There was the only two kinds of women left. Every other woman, they worked their way towards freedom. And this is a historical fact within the Sahaba's time. And that door to that, you know, that reform in society was opened by just two ayat of Qur'an, 32 and 33 of Surah An-Nur. Right? So this is a historical phenomenon that we have to understand. People are making criticism about our book, and they seem like heavy criticisms only for one reason. We don't know our book. That's the only reason it feels like, oh my God, how do you respond to that? When they tell us, kill them wherever you find them, the ayah they quote from Surah At-Tawbah or Surah Al-Baqarah and other places, right? Qatiluhum, you know, waqtuluhum, they kill them and fight them and kill them and fight them. How do we respond to that? And since we haven't studied our book, we don't know how to respond. But the reality of the matter is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this book to people who have decent fitrah, right? 
which means everything that is in Quran and everything that is in the Sunnah of the Messenger وسلم, appeals to decent human beings. It's just a matter of explaining it properly. Not compromising anything, it just has to be explained properly. Like the issue of concubines, put it in perspective to historically POW women, and it sounds like the most humane solution. Go to a woman that's imprisoned, a woman that's been imprisoned in a camp in China, or somewhere in, in Europe, right? Or in Russia or somewhere, and you give her the option, this is what Quran is offering you, and you can stay here if you want, because this is the Western solution. What would you take? You ask a professor somewhere sitting in a university on the leather couch discussing these things, he'll say, well, the Western solution is better. And ask a woman that's in that state, she'll say, I'll take the Islamic solution, please. Right? Because it's grounded in reality, not in theory. That's what it is. So we have to have confidence in our deen. You know, these things that are mentioned, they're not controversial, they're not things to be ashamed of, they're things that will actually poke a bigger criticism on society. Why aren't you looking at this solution? Do we have to tell you this? Or you're, you're telling us to do your way, that's obviously not working, right? So, إِلَّا عَلَىٰ أَزْوَاجِهِمْ أَوْ مَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ غَيْرُ مَلُومِينَ then they are not to be blamed. Then whoever pursues a way other than that, even if Allah made the halal means open, somebody pursues another way, then they are the ones that have transgressed. They are the ones that have transgressed. Inshallah ta'ala, we're just gonna discuss that, that part of it. The, the pursuit of ways other than marriage. And how the Muslim community has made the halal way of marriage so profoundly difficult for its youth, that the haram way is so much easier an option.